And inevitably, as we start to break down the protective barrier, then the walls themselves begin to get damaged. And as that happens, we've all heard of leaky gut. It's called intestinal hyperpermeability. And we do know that this can be temporary. So studies do show that even after one meal that's very rich, very high in saturated fats, or after one extremely intense spurt of exercise, after a very intensive, stressful day, um, or if in, you're suddenly inoculated by too many microbes, maybe you got food poisoning or gastroenteritis, that can cause leaky gut in just one day. Um, so it could be acute, it could be temporary, or it could be more chronic, more prolonged. So this could be long-term dysbiosis. This could be issues with that flow, that um, function, that motility. Um, and then from there, once we do know the mucus barrier is low or damaged, the the skin barrier itself, the gut epithelia is damaged, then they're leaking out, outside of that gut-associated lymphoid tissue, and they're then reaching your larger immune system. Um, so they're reaching the immune system that resides in the blood and in the lymph. And so this can lead to things like increased food intolerances or even allergies. We've seen things like histamine response, which I'm so thankful more and more practitioners are now talking about, something I talk about on a daily basis. It's going to really alert the nerves that are surrounding that gut. And so one could then have more what's called visceral hypersensitivity. Those nerves are just more sensitive to, oh, there's inflammatory bugs here. There's more bloat, there's more gas, there's more changes here. Um, and then ultimately we do know autoimmunity and even cancer can then develop from prolonged long-term chronic intestinal hyperpermeability. So we want to make sure we try to stop things in their tracks, listen to those symptoms. And if we're sensing that before that happens, that intestinal hyperpermeability happens, if we do find that we have some type of imbalance, we're really addressing it. Um, we do know with IBS, irritable bowel syndrome, especially IBS diarrhea type, IBSD, a predominant cause of that is gastroenteritis. So it is food poisoning. It's a traveler's gut bug. So that's really a change in the balance. Again, you're out of that beautiful synergy, that eubiosis. Now you're into that dysbiosis. Um, and so with that, that can lead to dysmotility. So based on the load of bugs in the gut and based on how the muscles and nerves are functioning in and around the digestive tract, we do know then that will alter the rate at which our gut is moving substances through. So whether that's food, whether that's bacteria and other bugs, whether that is debris, that pace will be altered based on who's living there, what's living there, what's going on in the barrier of the muscles and the nerves. So we could have it sped up and have diarrhea. We could have it significantly slowed down and then be experiencing constipation. We could experience both. I have some people who tell me from one day to the next, I have dry rabbit pellet stools that are like grapes that I'm forcing out. And then the next day I'm rushing to the restroom and it's liquid. Um, so there's so many things that can play into, again, that rate of movement, that motility. So this could also be things like pelvic floor issues. We have this bowl of muscles called the pelvic floor, and those hold up your digestive tract, your rectum, your reproductive organs, the bladder. And if something's off again in those nerves and muscles, ultimately that will dictate the rate at which you can expel the waste that your body did not intend to keep. Um, we could have scar tissue from past injuries or surgeries. We could have adhesions that usually are growing either from scar tissue or inflammation. And inflammation is usually coming from bugs. Um, we could again have nerve dysfunction or nervous system dysfunction. Again, I explained that the IBS is a disorder of the gut-brain connection. So when our nervous system is dysregulated and dysfunctional, our gut ultimately will become dysregulated and dysfunctional as well. And there's so many players in that. Again, so many hormones, so many neurotransmitters, muscles, nerves, um, so many things are really happening at the same time. So there could be one major player that's offsetting this whole cascade. There could just be a wide variety of those things. So it's up to a really highly specialized practitioner to help you determine that and really help you determine also who is supposed to live in your gut, 
who is over-functioning, who is in a place they shouldn't be. We all know that stool tests are all the rage these days. And I have people bring me stool tests from them self-ordering them. They might have had a chiropractor order it for them, or they might have had a gastroenterologist order it for them. And I think it's fine anywhere in that spectrum, as long as the person who's ordering it knows how to interpret it. So if you're unfamiliar with how to interpret these stool tests, I wouldn't recommend that you order yourself one because I've seen people see flags on there and then overreact and hyperreact. So for example, H. pylori is one thing that could come up on one of those functional stool tests, but it's not just the fact that it's high. You could have non-virulent H. pylori. That means it's non-active, it's non-aggressive, it's non-threatening. A large percentage of the world's population does have that H. pylori bacteria in their intestine. So it could be living in the stomach. It could be living in the colon. And if you're doing a stool test, that means it's in your colon. So if you're just seeing on the test, I have high H. pylori, let me take the strongest killing agents. Let me take grapefruit seed extract and let me take walnut and wormwood you might not have had an active form of H. pylori. And so, so often I actually have people come to me and say, well, so-and-so who ordered this for me told me I have H. pylori. And then I started taking all these crazy things to kill off that H. pylori. And now I have severe IBS. I have debilitating diarrhea. I have not had a regular bowel movement since. I have the worst gut hypersensitivity. So again, no matter who's ordering it for you, you really want to get an understanding of how familiar are you with interpreting this test. Um, so it's not just who can order it. It's who can properly interpret it for you to really assess who should be living there and who shouldn't. And, you know, we do know that there are so many things that play into, again, who moved into our gut apartment? Um, were, was there any influence of antibiotics? What did that look like for you in your entirety of your lifetime? Um, have they been very sparse, maybe less than a handful of times, or has it been a handful of times every month for you since you were born? You want to understand what has been your exposure to pesticides, whether you're someone handling pesticides, because again, your skin is a medium for things to get into your gut, or is it just consumption of pesticides? Because as James mentioned, any of those sides are basically killers. Um, what has been your experience in consumption with additives into foods, especially binders, gums, and emulsifiers, because we do know those can bind to our gut bugs, whether they're healthy or unhealthy. What has been your life stress? What has your motility pattern looked like? All of these things are going to dictate how many of those either healthy tenants we have in our gut or those less than ideal tenants that we have in there who are really not respecting the space and taking care of it and honoring it. Um, so one thing that we always ask, which we'll get into is what's your gut health story. That's always something I ask literally from womb to present day. I want to know, did your mom have gut issues because she can transmit bugs to you, even in utero, were you breastfed, were you vaginally delivered or C-section delivered, uh, were you colicky as a baby? Because now we're really understanding colic is usually gut inflammation. Um, what else was really influencing and impacting the balance of bugs in your gut? Um, so again, when the structure or the barrier, when the function or the motility or the flow, when the population is off, that can then lead to a wide variety of these gut symptoms. Um, and we know that IBS is on the rise. So usually if somebody has an alteration in bloat, discomfort, and or bowel movements for multiple days a month for several months in a row, Usually that collection of symptoms is then diagnosed as this disease or this disorder called IBS, irritable bowel syndrome. And worldwide, we know one in seven people are suffering from IBS. And it is a little bit more elevated in the United States. We have about 10 to 15% of our population here in the US who is diagnosed with IBS. And we know it's one of the number one causes people seek out medical attention. So it's one of the number one reasons that people are seeing their doctor or finding a dietitian. We know, unfortunately, now colorectal cancer is the fastest rising cancer in those 20 to 50. So our gut is really screaming at us at, as a population at large. So we really need to lean in and start to understand what is causing this 
irritable bowel? Why is our bowel irritable? What is it trying to communicate to us? Which one of those three main components is off? The structure, the function, the population. So if we are one of those people, again, who's been diagnosed with this disorder of the gut-brain connection, we really want to understand, one, what type do I have? Do I have it with constipation, with diarrhea? Is it mixed? Or is it uncategorized? I maybe don't fit in any of those things, but something is off. I'm missing work. I'm missing out on life. I have people who say, I just don't even go to restaurants anymore. If my friends and family are going out to eat, I just don't even join them. It makes me depressed because I can't even eat what they're eating. I feel like an outsider just being around them makes my stomach hurt. So I'm just, I'm missing out on life. And then again, that can psychologically affect who you are as a person. So we do know like we mentioned, you could still be checking off all the boxes. I ate my fiber, had my 30 different plants this week. I ate my four to six servings of fermented foods as is recommended. I'm exercising every day. Maybe I'm sleeping well and I'm still bloated, gassy. I'm refluxy, et cetera, et cetera. And we know now plants are not the cause of gastrointestinal disease and disorder. Yes, they can exacerbate it. So we do know that, especially fermentable plants. So fermentable carbohydrates usually are found in plant foods. Um, but that's why we're now hearing about diets that are saying, oh, you have those symptoms? Just don't eat something that's going to tell you what's going on. So we have people who say, I tried to go vegan. I tried to go plant-based. I tried to go Mediterranean and it didn't work. And now we're adding more confusion, not just of what we're feeling, but what we're hearing externally as well. We have these experts. Um, and again, you always want to question, what is this person's background? Um, but now we're having experts and healthcare professionals say, oh, plants bother you? Just don't eat them. Just avoid them. That's your cure. But are you truly cured? Because lack of symptoms does not equal healing. I cannot reiterate that enough. Lack of symptoms does not equal healing. If you are eating a plant and you know you're not actually allergic to it and you're experiencing symptoms with it, that means that you have work to do on your gut. It's not the plant. We always like to say we aren't gassy. They aren't gassy plants. We're gassy people. And so our if our bugs are flowing, functioning, moving as they should, they're going to handle those plants, extract nutrients from those plants, antioxidants from those plants, and they're going to feel great. It's really when we find ourselves in what James and I like to call gut debt, that that creates more nuance. And we need to really lean into that and try to understand it a little bit more. Um, so with this analogy with gut debt, we think of it as, hey, Maybe you were out there having a good time, right? You're like, YOLO, I'm going to spend all my money. I'm going to use then credit cards. I'm going to rack up credit card debt, uh, whatever. I I'm hearing that that's not good for me, but I I'm living my best life right now. And so that might be fine at that moment. You might not feel it at that moment. Maybe you're in your 20s and maybe you haven't had great financial advice. So you're just doing it all. And then you come into your 30s, you settle down, you want to buy a home and you go to the bank and ask for a loan. And they're like, no, you have terrible credit. You're in horrible debt. So oftentimes that is what happens. People say, I don't get it. I tried going, whatever. I tried eating a Mediterranean diet. I tried eating 80% plants and I feel horrible. It must be the plants. Well, no, I have that honest reflection and say, what happened in my past life? What did my gut debt look like? Um, what have you been racking up? Were you racking up antibiotics? Were you racking up substances that affected the way that your nerves were functioning? Did you experience lots of injuries, especially in your pelvic floor or any type of spinal injury that could affect the nerves that are really delegating and dictating your gut motility? So when you're finding the only way that I feel better is to cut out more and more and more and more foods till I'm really only eating protein, that means that you've likely found yourself in significant debt. So just because you can only eat protein and you don't feel any symptoms when you're only eating in protein, that doesn't mean you're out of debt and now you have great gut credit. It means you're still in debt and you have work to do. And we know just like fixing credit can be a pain, right? It's painful. It's it's humbling for you to say, all right, I messed up and I really need some help. Um, it's so important for us to really reflect on that with our gut debt as well 
and really ask ourselves what happened either to us or what were we involved in to get ourselves in that debt. And I want to just add the, the running away. I mean, the equivalent of that is like, I'm changing my phone. I'm changing my address. I'm ripping up the notices of my gut debt. And that is essentially saying I'm not eating cruciferous vegetables. I'm, I'm even like AIP kind of flows into there. Um, I'm eliminating potatoes and grains and legumes. And so that's the, again, the equivalent of like ripping up the notices and changing your email and your number. And you're just kind of, and then you're like, oh, great. I feel so much better. Like I'm not seeing, I'm not getting that stress of like, oh my gosh, I'm seeing these notices, right? I'm not getting that stress of like, oh, I'm feeling these symptoms. But then you're also just not communicating with your body. And remember, I have to reiterate, I know this is, this is a very, if, if you're watching this and you, you know, you're going to be here with us for two hours, congratulations, you're in it, right? You're here for a reason. And it's because you're searching for something. And really, like I mentioned, this is, this all continues to be a story of connection. You have been disconnected for whatever reason. And it was likely for all the factors we mentioned, and we're going to mention other ones, uh, but you've been disconnected from your gut. You've been disconnected from your nerves or your microbiome or your brain health and your lung health and all these things that we can disconnect from. It's now time to get reconnected. It's now time to face the communication, the symptoms head on, get connected. It's going to take some time. It's going to take some work, but it's way better. That is a way better solution than the alternative, which is continue to avoid, uh, continue to find quick fixes and just hope and pray. And then one day, hopefully it works out. 99.9% yeah. .9 of the time does not. So without the proper intervention at work. We're encouraging you do the work that it is required for you to have a great gut <laughs> credit score. So yeah. if you're in gut debt, don't fear. There's always this solution, always things that can be helpful. And for some people, we do know it's more chronic. Maybe they have a more chronic condition that's influencing how their gut feels. So you might need more chronic support. For some people, it's a one-time fix and then they're good again. Um, maybe their credit wasn't too, too damaged. So it's going to depend on what you have going on. But we do know that it's important to do this. It's going to dictate your long-term health. We saw that gut spiral and all the things that are influencing it. So we always want to remind people, today's gut symptoms are not just always about what you ate today. Again, you want to have that introspective reflection. You want to ask what happened leading up to this meal. Why is it that I can't eat beans? Why is it that when I eat broccoli, it gives me gas that smells like rotten eggs. You really want to ask yourself that because many people with IBS and something called SIBO, which we'll get into small intestinal bacterial or microbial overgrowth, restrict their diets often excessively and for a prolonged period of time. And they think this will solve the issues. So again, I'm in debt, I'm in debt, I'm in debt. Um, let me just fly under the radar. Let me just keep ripping things up, ignore, ignore, ignore. Um, and that seldom works long-term. I, I can tell you that. I've been a practicing dietitian for 11 years. I almost never see that that works as a long-term solution. So we really want to lean into what's going to heal my gut rather than what's going to help me ignore the symptoms, the, 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 